Hello and I'm glad you're back today. Today we're going to talk about AC power and more specifically power factor. Power factor is a really important number that determines how efficient our system in and is and also how much it costs from like the electric utilities in order to give us the energy. So to, let's just do an example to motivate our discussion. So here we have a load where it's operating at a power factor of 1.0 so it's a purely resistive load and we have the utility is providing us energy at 200 volts and it's a 60 hertz system and the electric utility has the ability to only generate a kilowatt and so if we would like to receive one kilowatt at our load let's examine what's going on here since it's a kilowatt we know that this must be average power and so the average power in this system is going to be the voltage which is 200 volts all right, and the current is unknown, and then it's the cosine of theta minus phi, which is the power factor. Cosine of theta minus phi is the power factor. And so we know if we're going to receive one kilowatt at our load, then when you do this analysis, the computation here, we know that we're operating at a power factor of 1.0, then we see that the current that flows is 5 amps RMS. And so in this particular situation we see that the utility is generating 1 kilowatt of power at their source and then since we're operating at a power factor of 1.0 our current and our voltage are in phase and then our load is receiving 1 kilowatt and for that to happen the utility is sending us 5 amperes of current. Now let's look at the situation where we have our load, but our load now has a power factor of 0.5. So if we do a similar derivation, and let's just assume for the moment that we want 1 kilowatt here at our load again, so we know that that's going to be the real power, the average power, that 1 kilowatt. It's 1,000 watts, and so that's going to be the voltage, and the voltage is 200. The current in this case is I, and the power factor is 0.5 cosine theta minus phi. So when you do this calculation, you see that the current required in this case is going to be 10 amps RMS. And so if we're going to get 10 amperes, if we're going to get one kilowatt in our load, then we must have a 10 amp current flowing to us. Now if you also go and see what's going, look back at the electric power utility at this point, we see that we also have the 10 amp current, but it's a 200 volt source and so we see that you know there's an increased power requirement. So in this case, this, this simple example, we're seeing that if the power factor of our load decreases from unity, in this case it went from 1.0 to 0.5, when the power factor decreases or gets worse, what happens is, is that the current must increase in order to maintain the same real power to our load. So as your power factor goes down, then you're going to have to increase the current in order to hold your real or average power constant. Well, there's a consequence to this also that, that's maybe a little bit not obvious until you stop and think about it. So let's take the same problem again and let's make it a little bit more realistic. So now we have our load and so this load corresponds to your house or to your industrial facility or whatever, you know, wherever you're working. And then the rest of the circuit here is a simple, a very simple model of how the energy gets to you. So this would be the uh, the voltage source here will be the power generation plant and the resistance shown in this diagram, R wire, will be the resistance of the distribution system, the wires that gets the energy from the generator to your facility. Now these wires are, are typically you know quite large but uh, and large in diameter, but they're also long, so we'll just make a number up just to, just to make our point. And so we'll just say one ohm to keep the math simple. So let's go back and look what we had before. In the first case, case one, 
on the previous chart, we saw that the current with the unity power factor was 5 amps RMS. And then when we went to the second case and our load had a power factor of 0.5, we saw the current had to increase to 10 amps RMS in order to maintain the same average power to our load. But notice in the diagram here, in that if, if we were to take our load and reduce the power factor from 1.0 and we were to make it worse and go down to 0 0.5, the utility generator hasn't changed. The distribution system that gets the energy to us has not changed. So let's look at what happens to the power in the wire. Remember, a resistor has a power absorbed of I squared R. And so in the first case, if we have a 1 ohm resistance, then we see that we're going to have 5 amps squared times 1 ohm and we'll see that we will absorb 25 watts in the wire that brings the energy to us. In the second case, again I squared R, we see that we're going to have 100 watts absorbed. So by simply taking our power factor, if our power factor gets worse, it goes from 1.0 to 0.5, we see the current has to increase in order to hold the real average power constant. And since the current increases, what happens is, is in this case the current doubled, what we see is the power absorbed by the utilities wires went up by a factor of 4 because of the squared term. So if you then the reason this is becomes a problem is because remember how you get charged for the energy. There is a, a, a energy meter that measures you know kilowatt hours and the meter is attached right here at your load. You know at your house the meter is on on the outside of your house right where the uh, electric utility enters your house or your factory. And so when the utility measures the energy the energy used by your load, they are measuring it right there at your load. Now stop and look and think that the energy in the wire, that power loss, that 25 watts or the 100 watts, has already been lost. And so the, all the electric utility sees is the one kilowatt being absorbed by your load because the meter is at your load. So when the power factor gets worse, the currents go up, and what the result is is that the utilities lose more and more money in terms of heat in the wires that are used in the distribution system to bring you that energy. And let's just see how bad it can get. So let's look at an example. So here we have a user that's absorbing 11 kilowatts at a unity power factor and 220 volts RMS. And the question is, if the distribution system has a, inner, a resistance of 0.2 ohms, what percentage of the power generated by the utility is only paid for by the user? So we know it's 11 kilowatts, and so 11 kilowatts is going to be average power. So 11 kilowatts, and of course average power is VRMS, which is 220, times IRMS, which is what we don't know, times the power factor, or cosine theta minus V, and this is a unity power factor, 1.0. So this means in this particular situation that I RMS, the, the current required to get the 11 kilowatts to the user, is going to be 50 amps RMS. And so the power loss in the wire is going to be this 50 amps quantity squared times 0 0.2 ohms and that calculation results in 500 watts being lost in the wire. So there's 500 watts of power loss before it even gets to the user. Now remember what does the user pay for? The user pays for the power the energy used at the actual load and so the user is only going to pay for the 11 kilowatt rate but we see that because there's 500 watts lost in the wire, the utility's having to generate 11.5 kilowatts. 11.5 kilowatts are generated, only 11 actually makes it to the load. And then so what we're left with is that the user is only paying for 95.6% of the energy that's being generated.
Well, then it's even worse because remember we have the 0 0.2 ohms in the wire before it gets to the load. And the current that's flowing here is 50 amps RMS. Well, a current being directed into a resistance is going to give rise to a voltage drop. And so we see that we're going to have to generate an additional 10 volts to make up. So instead of if we need 220 volts at the load, we're going to have to generate 230 volts at the generator in order for to make up for the the voltage drop across the resistor. But the main problem is is that we're only paying for 95% 95 96% of what the utility is actually generating. The rest of it the utility is having to eat or absorb themselves because uh, the meter is only located at at the load. Well, that's just kind of the cost of doing business, but it gets out of hand when the power factor gets worse. So let's take the same scenario, and we'll have an 11 k watts are required. Again, 220 volts at our load. We're looking for the new current, and now we have that power factor of 0.5 again. And when you do this, you find that the current required in this case is going to be 100 amperes. So since we've cut the power factor in half, the current has to double. And so you have 100 amps. Now remember we have the 0.2 ohm wire that gets the energy to us. We have 100 amperes of current flowing. So the power being lost in the wiring to bring us this energy is 100 amps squared times 0.2 ohms. And we see we're losing 2 kilowatts in the wiring. So what percentage of the power are we paying for? Well, we're only paying for the 11 kilowatt rate because the load meter is located uh, at our installation. And then the utilities having to generate 13 kilowatts because they're going to lose 2 kilowatts in the wiring. And then we only end up paying for 84.6%. So there's a 15% loss that the utility is going to have to absorb. So utilities get really upset when your power factor starts going down. When your power factor starts going down, that requires an increased current, which means they lose more power in the wiring in order to get that energy to you. And since the energy is only measured at your load, they're going to see, uh, no matter what we do, they're going to measure 11 kilowatts of power usage. But as our current drops, the utility is going to have to generate more and more and more power at their generator in order to create this large current because of our bad power factor. And so the utilities don't like that. So what most utilities do is there is a power factor penalty schedule. And this is just representative. Depending on what utility is, these numbers may change. But the utilities have a penalty schedule where they will watch their customers and measure the power factor at the their customer's end and determine what, what the number is and attach a penalty. And if your power factor is greater than 85%, then there is no penalty. You just pay for the energy that's recorded on the meter. And as we saw, the utility is, of course, losing a little bit of money because there's always going to be some loss in the wires. If they're sending the energy to you, there's going to be some loss in the, in the distribution system. But that's been worked into the rates, and they're just going to charge you what the meter shows, and then that, that loss is accounted for in the higher rates that they give you. But if your power factor gets worse, they come out and the rules know something like if it's if the power factor is in this range for three months in a row, then what they're going to do is they're going to take your energy bill and they are going to add a 1% penalty for your poor power factor. And you can see through the numbers, as your power factor gets lower and lower and lower, they will start tacking on larger and larger penalties. And if your power factor drops below, let's say, like 70%, again, this number varies from utility to utility, they'll tack on 25%, because they really don't want your power factor starting to get this bad. One reason for this, remember, is the power factor is the cosine of theta minus phi. And so as theta minus phi increases, the cosine function starts off and then, then starts turning downward. And so at some point, there's some magic point here where the utilities no longer can take it, because every every bit of decrease in your power factor really starts hurting more and more and more, causing larger and larger losses. So that they get to a certain point where they just really won't tolerate a worse power factor because they're on this downward trend where it's getting very steep. They don't like that.
So if you have a, an installation, so you have a factory or a large uh, city or something, and the power factor gets poor, then you're going to start paying this penalty. And you don't want to pay this penalty because it's just money you're giving the utilities and you're not getting any, any use or work out of it. So you'd want to improve your power factor, which leads us to the, the problem of power factor correction. What if you have a large facility or a large motor and your power factor is poor? And so this is a problem that crops up quite a bit in AC power and especially if you work in a lot of large industrial factory settings. So the problem we have today is we're going to correct the power factor of this motor. We have a 230 volt motor, single phase, 50 kilowatts, it's got a power factor of 0.8 lagging. We see from the chart on the previous slide that you know that's going to give a penalty and we don't want to pay the penalty so we need to improve our power factor. Now so we are at 0.8 with our power factor so we're operating with this penalty and we're going to bring it back we want to improve our power factor up to our power factor equals 0 0.95 now we could improve our power factor all the way back to 1 to get rid of the penalty but as long as we exceed 0 0.85 the penalty goes away and if you we'll do the analysis and you'll see the more you improve your power factor the more expensive that improvement that that correction becomes so you just want to improve it enough to get rid of the penalty in this case we're going to improve it to 0.95 and that gives us a little bit of room for it to worsen again before the penalty kicks in. So we want to correct our power factor up to 0 0.95. Now this is a motor. A motor of course is built with a bunch of windings so it's an inductive load and that's the reason the power factor is it's a lagging power factor so it's an inductive load and so in order to create to correct the inductive load, to correct the inductance that our motor is generating we are going to correct it with capacitance. And the question is what size capacitor do we need? Alright let's get started. Well we know that the average power in our system is 50 kilowatts that is given to us. So 50,000 watts. But we also know that that's V RMS, I RMS, cosine of theta minus V, which is our power factor. And I love to start with these problems and, and actually just draw the power triangle. I think it makes a lot more sense to keep, to figure out what's going on. So we'll draw the power triangle here. And we know the that we have 50 k watts down here. So then we also know what the apparent power is because the relationship between apparent power and average power is the power factor. So the apparent power is going to be the average power divided by the power factor which is 50 over 0 0.8 and this will be 62 and a half kVA. And we can use the sine or you can use Pythagoras and you'll discover that this is 37.5 kVar. And so, and then the angle here can be found as the arc cosine of 0 0.8 and that works out to be about 37 degrees. And so we could write the complex power of our motor. Our motor has a complex power. It's going to be 62.5 angle 37 degrees, and that's kVA. Or in the, the rectangular form, it's going to be 50 plus J. It's an inductive load, so it's, it's absorbing a reactive power, 37.5 kVA. And what we'd like to get to is we'd like to get to a point where we have a motor the motor still needs 50 kilowatts but I want to reduce the power factor and we have a new power triangle here drawn in blue and we'll try to draw this and maybe it won't get too messy uh, this is still 50 kilowatts the new apparent power here is the 50 kilowatts in our new power factor that we're shooting for, what we want to correct it to is 0 0.95 and that's going to give us 52.6 and so we found this number is 52.6 kVA and then we can use our trig and we'll find this is about 18 degrees and then the new reactive power is going to be about 16.4 KVAR. And so the corrected complex power can be written in both ways and we'll just write down 
the rectangular version. So after we correct our motor, what the utility sees is this complex power. And so the question is, how do I take the red triangle and get the blue triangle from it? And that is very easy. I need to take a reactive power that is negative and is this long. I need to take the point up here and reduce it to this point right there. And so what I'm looking for is the the capacitor I add is going to have a complex power which is the vector that takes the point from the original complex power of the motor to the corrected complex power and that results in negative J 21.1 kVA. So if I take the capacitor's complex power, add it to the original motor's complex power, I will now get the corrected complex power. So whatever element I add is going to be, needs this negative J 21.1 kVA. So now the question is, what the, we need to find what capacitor is this. Well, remember, complex power is VI conjugate, which means I'm looking for the current. So current I conjugate is S over V, but then if I want I, I need to conjugate that. And so when you do this computation, you find that the current that needs to flow in our capacitor is 91.6 amperes. And that's simply taking the complex power and dividing by the voltage. We know the voltage. It's 230 volts. And maybe it's not clear to you, but when we're adding these capacitor. So here we have our motor that needs to be corrected. And the utility is out here giving us 230 volts. When we add our motor, our excuse me, our capacitor to our motor, we need to add it in parallel because the motor requires 230 volts. If we were to attach the capacitor in series, we could correct the power factor but then the current, the series current flowing through the capacitor would reduce the voltage at the motor. So in order to keep the voltage of the motor constant, the capacitor gets added in series. And so that's why I know that the voltage across the capacitor is still 230 volts because it's in series with the utility and with the motor. So now that we have the motor, excuse me, the capacitor current, J91.6, we can then go and find out what the actual capacitor itself needs to be because remember that the impedance of our capacitor is going to be V over I, so I have 230 angle zero as the voltage across my capacitor. I know it's J91.6 amps RMS in my capacitor which means if I do the calculation, I'll find that the impedance of the required capacitor is minus J 2.51 ohms. Now the question was, what is the actual size capacitor required? And remember that the magnitude of a member Z is minus J 1 over omega C. And at this point, this is a nice check, by the way, because we haven't made any assumptions here in doing this derivation. And we end up with a negative, a purely negative reactance for our capacitance. And of course, we know that capacitors will have purely negative reactants. So I think we're on the right track here. And so this means I can figure out what capacitor I need, because 1 over omega C must equal 2.51. And when you do this, you'll find the required capacitance is going to be about 1,056 microfarads. So this is how we can correct the power factor of a bad power factor load with a capacitor in, ser in, in parallel. And we do this quite a bit in, in practice. So this is a problem you want to study and look at and <clears throat> learn how it works because you will see it again and again.